So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can we just take some seats, please? So we can make a start. You can take, uh, take your seats, please, so we can make a start. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So we're gonna kick off. Okay. So welcome to this session, the Climate Change Adaptation Lab, uh, Resilient Regions and Good Governance. And uh, delighted to be hosting this event uh, in partnership with the Scottish Government, the California State Government, Adaptation Scotland and Climate Kick. And also a sincere, sincere thanks to uh, Regions 4 for their partnership uh, in building these two events this afternoon as part of a, uh, a sequence of conversations where we hope we can uh, take forward the agenda of regional ambition on adaptation um, and work in partnership so we can share learning between regions. So just to say, as with our other events, we do have uh, a panel here in the room and also welcome to our um, online uh, audience as well. Um, the difference in this event from the one that we've had before, as I mentioned, it's a lab. So we are going to have speakers uh, from the stage. They're going to keep their comments brief. They're going to be uh, inspirational and, and provocative in terms of regional leadership on adaptation. At least we hope not to give you too high a billing. Um, and uh, then we're going to pass into a workshop format. So where we're going to have in the room, uh, exchanges between the audience and regions and the same online. We're going to facilitate those, we're going to have a conversation and we're going to come back and share some headlines from them. So hopefully a little bit more uh, kind of interactive, a bit more practical in the way we want to take this forward um, and we're really looking forward to an exciting session. After that, for those of you who are in the room, um, at uh, 5.45 we're going to be uh, hosting a reception. And so we really do encourage you to stay. It's an opportunity to network between regions. Um, and we also have a set of exciting, exciting announcements and obviously a few drinks and, and, and nibbles as well. So you're delighted for you to stay uh, after the end of the session. So we've got an incredible lineup of speakers to, to speak to you today, really drawing on uh, regional expertise and, uh, and climate adaptation ambition. Um, and I would like to start by inviting Mr. Matheson Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero Energy and Transport in the Scottish Government to take the floor and make some opening remarks. Mr. Matheson, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for the opportunity to say a few words at the beginning of this important event. And can I extend in particular a warm welcome to uh, Secretary Crowfoot and his team uh, from the state of California. And I'm, I'm particularly pleased to be sharing the platform with California on the basis that we have had a long-standing relationship with California in demonstrating 
the leadership that is necessary at a subnational level in tackling uh, climate change. I'm also pleased to see Eduardo here from San Paulo. I shared a platform with him earlier on the, uh, this morning. And uh, again, uh, a city where they are showing tremendous leadership in tackling at a subnational level the measures which are necessary to tackle climate change. I'm often struck by the uh, debate around climate change as though it's one which is um, climate change will happen in the years ahead. And we need to take action now simply to avert climate change. The reality is that we already have climate change locked in to our planet as it is today. Only in the course of the last few months have we experienced severe flooding in the south of Scotland. We have experienced uh, serious uh, intense weather events that have quite literally caused people their lives and that have caused major disruption uh, to key parts of Scotland's national infrastructure, all coming about as a result of locked-in climate change that is affecting our uh, climate on an almost weekly basis. Now, I was sharing with uh, Secretary uh, Crawford that in Scotland, it may not feel like it today, but some of our water reservoirs are at a 160-year low, and some are at their lowest point on record. Why? Because we have just come through one of the driest summers we have ever had on record. So we are already seeing the impact of the events as a result of climate change that's already locked in to our weather system having a direct impact on people's lives on a day in, day out basis. Which is why it is critical that we have the right mitigations and the right adaptation plans in place to try and address these issues. In Scotland, we have our climate change adaptation plan, which sits alongside our climate change plan, but very often not given the same prominence and level of recognition as our climate change plan. But it is equally important if we are to manage the impact that climate change is already having on our society. And key to delivering our climate change and adaptation plan is not just the actions which we can take forward at a national level, but is working with our partners at a localised level, our local authorities, our city councils, our city leaders, all of whom have a key role to play in helping to address the, and to adapt to the changes we're experiencing in our climate. But the reality is uh, we don't have all of the answers. Uh, and it's important if we are to address these emerging issues uh, in a, an effective way, we need to work in partnership with colleagues across the world. And one of the opportunities that you have here this afternoon is to share experience, to share knowledge, and to build links in order to make sure that we are collaborating in order to tackle the impact of climate change on our weather system and on our society today. I often feel as a politician that people often think that climate change is someone else's responsibility. Someone else will fix it for us. Or that when part of our water system is overwhelmed because of a storm which goes way beyond what it was ever designed for, or where we experience periods of dry weather that why did we just not build bigger water reserves? Well, the reality is that we are now finding that infrastructure within our own society is no longer able to cope with the rapid changes we're experiencing within our weather on a regular basis, which is why it is critical that we learn from others on the way in which they're adapting their planning in order to address these growing challenges. And even in cities like Glasgow, there has action been taken very close to this point today in order to use the River Clyde uh, as a means by which we can use it to adapt uh, to the climate change we are experiencing, but also to help to support us in mitigating against some of the impact of climate change as well. And one of the key things that I believe we have to do in climate adaptation is make greater use of our natural assets. Make sure we are using our 
floodplains effectively, that we are using our carbon sinks effectively, such as our peatlands, and also our water courses in a way that can help to draw away some of the impact that climate change is having. And that requires a fundamental shift in our thinking and a, and a change in the way in which we go about planning in matters and the way in which we use our land as well. That brings challenges, but in my view, it brings even greater opportunities. So in the course of your discussions here the, this afternoon, I'll be very keen to hear and to learn about the actions which you are taking or that you are considering taking in order to adapt to tackling the impact of climate change and making sure we get across the point is that climate change is not something which will happen in the future. Climate change is something which is happening now and we need to adapt to it and to change to cope with the impact that it's having. So I wish you well with the course of your discussions and I hope that during your time here in Scotland you have an opportunity to make connections with other like-minded individuals and uh, subnational governments and devolved governments across the world and to share and collaborate on how we tackle the issues of climate change and adaptation to climate change today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Matheson. So we are now going to pass to Secretary Crowfoot, California's Natural Resources Secretary, and uh, State Government of California. Um, and just I wanted to say, and I forgot to say at the start, that the reason why we've brought the regions together, nations together that are on our stage, is because we found that they are some of the most forward thinking and ambitious in relation to climate adaptation, and also have already been cooperating and working together. And I think in the case of California, we have a lot to learn from a place that it has enormous challenges. But Secretary Crowfoot, over to you. Well, thanks so much. And I'll start with a heartfelt thanks to Scotland. It's incredibly courageous uh, for your government to actually pull this together as we continue to navigate the global pandemic. And I have to say, we were sharing with you earlier, um, it's, been a, it's been so well organized. And I, 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 for one, was relieved that we were meeting in person because I thought, you know, given the stakes, given the urgency right now, that another year of postponing this gathering uh, is, I, I don't want to say catastrophic, but highly problematic. So since we have no time to waste, thank you. And I think it's important that we're here and, and I'll be a little provocative, not necessarily because of our, uh, our, our national partners, although I hope they continue to increase ambition, but because of the connections that we'll make uh, across our regional governments. One of our governors in, in, uh, in Washington state in the United States has stopped using the word subnationals and he uses the word supernationals because that's what it's gonna take uh, for us. Climate adaptation uh, is obviously both a complex and highly localized. While this race towards net zero is no doubt the challenge uh, of our planet right now in terms of stabilizing our climate, we know that climate adaptation is no longer a planning exercise. Climate resilience is not optional. It's about saving lives and livelihoods. In California, a fairly wealthy place, one of the fifth largest economy in the world, we are literally fighting existential threats driven by climate change. So we have fire to work with uh, governments across the world and understand what we need to do collectively. And I can tell you every bilateral discussion I've had uh, here uh, in the last few days, I've learned something. I learned that the autonomous region of Andalusia, Spain suffers from the same catastrophic wildfires, the same persistent drought challenges that we have. That the state of Jalisco, Mexico, similarly, uh, wildfires, drought, uh, the, the province of Quebec, um, doing incredible work merging nature-based solutions uh, to climate change. So we need to learn from each other and we need to engage in this type of learning and innovation. In the United States, we talk about our states as laboratories of innovation. We know how to get it done. We're not afraid to try and fail and learn from others and, and teach others. And that's what I, I hope we're doing here today in this, in this lab. I wanna leave you with our approach to climate resilience in California and really ensuring that we're avoiding silos between drought and wildfire and extreme heat. 
and, and flooding and sea level rise. Those are the five big threats. So we have just released for public consideration uh, our resilience strategy, and it's got six North Stars. North Stars meaning these should orient our efforts across, I would say California, but I'll say the world. Number one, we need to be uh, making decisions based on the best available science which is easier said than done. We need to share scientific expertise to understand how these threats are changing and how we can protect ourselves. Number two, we have to identify the most vulnerable communities that require our priority. In the United States, we have tremendous inequity around vulnerability to climate impacts, oftentimes based on, on income or location. So we need to prioritize vulnerable communities. Number three, we truly have to understand the public health impacts of, these, uh, of climate change. Extreme heat, for example, in California, we don't know enough about how it's impacting uh, vulnerable uh, elderly and children. We need to understand that more. To the minister's point, uh, our number four, um, we have to integrate nature. It sounds so intuitive and it's remarkable that in so many ways, some of the challenges we have are because we separated ourselves from nature. Nature is not a place we visit, nature is home. And we need to reintroduce nature to, to, to build our resilience. Fifth point, none of this matters if we don't work to grow economic prosperity and achieve uh, equity across our communities. We know that our citizens are demanding climate resilience, but they also want uh, good livelihoods. So all of our resilience actions need to build a, a resilient economy. Fit for, sixth point, last point, partnerships. Sounds like a talking point. We all talk about partnerships, but they're so essential. States are not going to do it alone. Provinces, cities, autonomous regions. Um, we, have to, we have to work together. In California, that means actually developing these strategies in partnership with local organizations, tribal governments, county governments, city governments, because even in California, the resilience threats that we, uh, I should say the climate threats that we experience are so localized. So with those six principles, we're looking forward to participating in the lab here today with my, with my colleague Nguyen Tara, who helps lead our work and learning from you all in terms of how to collectively uh, advance our climate resilience. Thanks so much. Thank you. And actually, with unfortunately, Secretary Crowford and Mr. Matheson have to leave the stage at the moment for other events. But thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time and for your words. Appreciate it. OK, and now uh, we pass on to Eduardo Trane, Director of the Environment, the Infrastructure Environment Secretariat in the Sao Paulo Regional Government. Mr. Trane, over to you for your remarks. Okay, good afternoon to everybody. Thank you so much again. We've been together this morning with also my colleagues, the colleague from California. And I, I want to present our experience on going further on resilience propositions. And I uh, start saying, please, the next one, just very fast. Yeah, okay, uh, just to, to show you, uh, the reality we're talking about in the state of Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is a country, 43 million people and 645 municipalities. There are not as many as in France, for example, that you have 23,000 in France with the same area, but we have 60, 45 municipalities. What is very important for local government and resilience uh, strategies. We have uh, the biggest GDP in Brazil, the larger than Argentina, Sweden, or Belgium. We are 32% of the people of Brazil. It means that we are very, sorry, if you come back to the, to the map, uh, we are very unequal. Uh, you don't have in the territory the same uh, opportunities. This is very unequal. So you have the very vulnerable, the very more uh, poor countries in municipalities. So the, the politics of uh, resilience is very important to do in this sense. Again, please, the next one. Uh, 
we have commitments, the state of San Paolo, that are very important and brought to the scope. Uh, we had a, a law from climate change from 2009, which started, but now this July, our governor signed race to zero. But uh, talking with Gonzalo, we said it's very important that they also adhere to the race to resilience, and we did it. We did it by a decree, and we have the time for the next year to July, to December next year to bring a plan of adaptation of all the 645 municipalities. That's very important. We have a climate plan action that I just brought for you uh, is off the table and uh, plan uh, and a review of our state energy plan for the next year and a very strong regulatory frameworks in this year. So we have all the tools, but is that enough to tackle resilience? That's the question I want to put you. Please, the next one. Uh, our partnership for this project, special project, is with the pro adapter of the government, the, 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 the German government, the GIZ. They are providing support to the government of Brazil implementation of our national agenda of adaptation and climate change. What's very important, supporting the state and Sao Paulo and resilience. Next one, please. And the first thing we did is talk my colleague in his third point is, to the second one, the most vulnerable, who are they? And the first job we did is just uh, increasing a lot of indicators and we got this classification of capacity of resilience of all these municipalities. As you can see in the coastline, is in the base, always the coastline, there are the walls because we have a lot of problem in this region that's very rich on biodiversity. It's the great forest in Brazil, that Atlantic forest and all the problems is where most of the population is there. 80% of populations in the coastal areas and is where more resilience is need to be uh, kept the building. That's very important. The first thing we did, this can combine good policies for those who needs more than the others, uh, because we don't have all the money to do everything, because it implies in a lot of infrastructure, uh, capacity building with the, the communities, and we're doing following these jobs. This is the first product, please, next one. And to start, uh, we 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 doing the pilot activities in 13 municipalities. Uh, we decide to see prototypes, and we do them with them. And in one region, that's the yellow region, that's Santos, where is the port, the biggest port in Brazil, and we have a lot of uh, problems in this port in in in, in question of resilience. So these are what we're doing till December and next year we intend to extend to all municipalities a program of a capacity building that starts by capacity and then following uh, budgets for, for uh, works we need to do in how the country to be more resilient and we will be able to report. Next one, please. Uh, the main strategy was to create a econ economical, ecological zoning with a climate lens that's used a geo social environmental data of Sao Paulo. That's very important, social environmental, to, to kept, to, to, to uh, uh, retire the information for the most vulnerable. I think that's very important for the developing countries. We don't have as here in Scotland or in England or in Europe that we have more or less the same distribution of economy and, and wealth. There you need to go pointedly for the most needed. And we are doing this. This is a state support municipality. It's a, a huge tool, very new. It took six years to deal with it with the, the International Bank, all the experts, and everybody can use this tool now to go to Brazil and knows where is more resilient or not. We have a very good uh, tool uh, to planning, uh, attacking the territory. Next, please. And uh, already some results, a guide for adaptation uh, that's just uh, went out, uh, that's approach uh, nature-based solutions approach with mainstream gender and human heights also included in this uh, adaptation of resilience. Then the methodology, I want to talk about it. Next one, please. And just to finish, to say that the most relevant sectors of the state plan of adaptation and resilience are there. Of course, everybody knows, but I want to tell you just a few things. The state of Sao Paulo is in the least, in the last few years with 43 million, we suffered the most uh, 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 severe water scarcity for drought. In 2014, we had the drought 
after 90 years, we brought this example to the COP. And what happened? We had to adopt. We had to, uh, to, to, to adapt. And from 2040 to 21, we thought it wouldn't repeat. And this year, we have it even worse than 2014. Hopefully, we did a lot of work on infrastructure. It costs a lot of money of the state of Sao Paulo. We did it, otherwise we'd be in the second crisis after 90 years, 100 years for the water scarcity that was very important. Then floods, we have so many floods this year that we didn't have before and we need to adapt to that. Erosion for agriculture, very, very strong erosion all around the country with many significant impact of uh, agricultural economy. And the forest fires, we had it this year, the most, Important forest fights, 5,000 from May to November. That's our fire period that it's finishing. Hopefully we're very happy, but we put a lot of money on that and we put people to work on adaptation. And if you hadn't done this, it would be worse than last year that we had just 3,000 fires points. And all these means capacity uh, investments, budgets, etc. And also the coastal phenomena, uh, many, coastal phenomenon of invasion of the areas of the sea. The, the, we, we hadn't seen this before for a long time. So uh, climate change is absolutely actual. Uh, if you talk to a mayor, when you go to the, the mayor of the city, he says, well, for me, it's flood <laughs> and it's drought. I don't have water and flood my city. This is climate change for them. And we need to talk their language. We need to go into the small communities and go to these small communities because they are who are suffering the most. This is what I had to say, say that I'm completely alike with my friend from California. In, in, the, in the crisis of water, we were together, Sao Paulo and California, we did a very straight, uh, because they had a lot of growth over there in 2014, 13, and we were the same and we learned from each other, okay? Thank you, I took too much time. Uh, if I don't know if the lab had all this time, I'm very happy to be with you and Sao Paulo is ready to the working on uh, resilience. And I, I believe next year we have a great plan and this is due to regions four that we are working together and uh, pro adapta this program with uh, the uh, German government. And uh, this is my team, Jusara, please put, uh, she, she's uh, the leader of this project with me and Fernanda that's over there is the leader also. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Really excellent uh, example and exciting plans from Sao Paulo region. And I think you can see within this session, what we're trying to do is slowly build levels of detail, uh, the sense of direction, ambition, given the sheer scale of the threats that are faced in many multiple ways. So we're gonna take the original comments that we had from uh, Mr. Matheson and from Secretary Crowfoot and invite other members of the team that are more technical level to now come to the stage and to talk about what is happening in those particular uh, uh, places. So I really uh, delighted to invite David Mallon, Head of Policy and Implementation, the Domestic Climate Change Division of the Scottish Government, to talk in a little bit more detail about Scotland, Scotland, Scottish Government's plans for a more ambitious adaptation action. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. The uh, other speakers have already outlined the uh, challenges uh, that we face uh, in terms of the locked-in impacts of climate change. Uh, and this lab provides an opportunity to share our experiences and solutions that can hopefully work in other settings, regions and countries. I look forward to the discussion and hearing from the diverse voices we have here and in the room and online. But before I do so, I'd like to expand on some of the approaches we are taking at, in Scotland at the national, regional and local level. First of all, science and uh, risk assessment form a central part of our approach to enhancing climate resilience in Scotland. A climate change risk assessment is undertaken every five years and is published by the independent UK Climate Change Committee. The latest assessment was published in June it involved 200 experts from around the UK and assessed 61 climate 
risks and opportunities. And the results show, unfortunately, a more severe and worsening landscape of climate-related risk across the UK and including Scotland. Eight priority areas are identified as needing more action within the next two years, including risks for terrestrial and freshwater habitats and species, soil health, natural carbon stores, crops, livestock, and commercial trees, supply of food, goods, and vital services, and human health and well-being. Recent activity at the national level in Scotland has included a Climate Resilience Summit, which was held last month uh, and brought together 100 leaders, chief executives, directors of public, private, and voluntary organizations. The summit included a discussion of that latest risk assessment and an ambition statement was one product uh, with everyone um, supporting action to enhance our climate resilience. And the reflections from that summit will be used to build on our current national adaptation program, which Michael Matheson referred to, uh, and which contains over 170 policies and proposals which are aligned with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. One other feature of our system is um, that uh, there's a duty to review and update our plan every five years, and Scottish ministers are, in addition, required to provide annual progress reports to Parliament. The adaptation programme that Mr Matheson referred to um, includes outcomes which support national, regional and community action. The adaptation programme also contributes to a just transition by seeking to ensure that those people most vulnerable to climate change are able to adapt. And the programme also supports our coastal and marine environments, islands and rural communities. Another outcome across urban and rural settings is to ensure our society's supporting systems and infrastructure are resilient to climate change. All seven of the outcomes are supported by a programme which provides capacity building and action on adaptation for public sector businesses and com communities in Scotland through um, an organisation called Adaptation Scotland. Our national programme in Scotland is complemented also by partnerships at the city regional level, such as Climate Ready Clyde here in the Glasgow city region and other emerging partnerships in island areas and rural areas, such as Highland Adapts in the Highlands of Scotland. These regional initiatives enable local place-based solutions to be designed and delivered in partnership, and the innovations being developed at a regional scale by these initiatives are helping to inform and improve our national approaches as well. For example, Climate Ready Clyde's work on uh, arts and culture and also climate finance are notable examples. And the informal network of local and regional initiatives provides a foundation for knowledge transfer and for sharing of experiences. So to conclude, I hope this brief outline of our approaches being followed in Scotland is useful and I look forward to hearing other views today uh, on our key themes in the breakout sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Malinan. So certainly from the experience of Climate Kicks work in Scotland, we've been really delighted to see the way in which um, within Adaptation Scotland's planning and uh, Climate Ready Clyde, the use of arts and culture to really get to think about different ways of framing resilience has been a fabulous way of pushing the kind of public imagination around resilience in a very different way to how we normally plan in a much more technocratic way. So that's been a fabulous innovation from Scotland. Thank you. Now, without further ado, let me pass to Nguyen Tara Key, Deputy Director for Climate Resilience of the Governor's Office for Planning and Research in the California State Government. Nguyen Tara. Wonderful, thank you all so much for the opportunity to be here. And I just wanna extend a sincere thank you to the Scottish government um, for hosting and for the uh, work together to plan this session today, as well as Climate Kick, um, who's been a great partner of ours for many years um, and hopefully many more to come. So thank you all. So as Secretary Crowfoot laid out um, earlier just now, you know, California is already experiencing the devastating impacts of climate change across the state as we are witnessing around the globe. In California, on any given day, there are nearly a million people without access to clean drinking water. 
um, across the state. And as droughts uh, become more extreme, we are seeing more and more communities impacted. And as was mentioned before, it is the communities with the least capacity and the least resources who are affected first and worst. So our climate adaptation and resilience work is uh, specifically focused on how we build capacity, not just across the state and across regions, but also within communities and locally to really respond to the impacts that we're seeing. Secretary Crowfoot also earlier today spoke about the wildfires, which you know across the state this year, we've seen over 2 million acres um, burned across the state, you know, creating um, terrible air quality for millions of Californians across the state. And we also experienced the hottest summer on record in many places across the state. And just a couple weeks ago, we had a um, atmospheric river that dumped more rain in a course of 24 hours in the Sacramento region than we have seen all year. So we are experiencing these impacts as our communities around the globe. And while California stays committed to ambitious emissions reductions and uh, staying a global leader in pushing towards uh, carbon neutrality and the goal towards um, net zero, we also have done tremendous work over the last few years and under the Newsom administration to drive on an integrated approach that recognizes climate changes here and we have to adapt while also reducing emissions. So to drive on this truly integrated approach, I'm gonna hit on three themes that we are driving on in California in our resilience work and tee up some questions that we hope to learn from you all here today to help us um, understand as we're working through in real time how to build resilience and reduce risk of climate change in California. So the first theme that I wanna to touch on is the translation of climate science to accelerate implementation. The second is the role of the state or other regional or subnational governments in providing strategic direction and a framework to guide collective action. And the third is the importance of driving regional solutions that meet the needs of diverse communities within a state or a subnational government. So first, as David framed out in California, we uh, as um, work here in Scotland, in California, we similarly have a climate change assessment. And this assessment is per state law now supposed to be updated every five years. And as we're looking to implement the fifth California climate change assessment right now, we're really looking at how do we take the science and our investment in research to inform policy, but actually translate that science much faster to inform policy making on the ground. And how do we provide communities across the state with the tools and resources they need to make climate informed decision making. So as we go through the course of discussion here, we would love to learn from you and how you're working to support communities in this much faster translation and implementation of science into policy. So on the second theme around the state adaptation strategy, Secretary Crowfoot um, reviewed and provided insight on the three priorities that we've mapped out in our draft strategy. And I just want to take a moment to recognize that while each one of the strategies that we release builds on the successes of previous versions, we really wanted to take a very strategic and exciting opportunity this go round to really drive on a whole of government approach. So rather than outlining a strategy on a sector by sector or siloed approach, we really wanted to bring our work as a state to Together to identify clear priorities and goals. Goals that not only help inform state action, but can serve as a resource and guide for our partners within regions and within communities to again drive on that collective action. One of the other exciting pieces about our strategy this update for this update is the inclusion of resilience metrics and that are time bound. And this is the first time that we in California have actually created a series of metrics related to our state adaptation strategy. So I'm very excited to learn from everybody here in the room and to hear from those of you online, how are you approaching this very rapidly evolving field of developing metrics to help guide and inform our work, but also include transparency and accountability as we're driving to build resilience. And then third and finally, 
that I want to um, touch on this idea of building regional um, scaling at a regional um, scaling ad ad adaptation efforts at a regional scale, and the importance of building feedback loops between local and regional and state systems and communities. And in our office, the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, we run our integrated climate adaptation and resiliency program, which is explicitly charged with being that hub for bringing different sectors and different scales together to identify solutions and support local implementation. So one of our priorities here that we are focused on, and we're very lucky in California to have the significant funding that just came through this budget to support resilience and adaptation, but is how we actually work to build capacity within communities so that they are at the table to help inform these local, regional, and state policies and priorities. So I'll close by just saying very excited for the conversation here and to learn from you all on these questions that we're working through in real time. With that, I'll hand it back. Thank you so much, Nuintara. So this is the moment in the discussion now where we move from the presentations at the front to have you do a little bit of work. And so both online and in the room, we're going to run a breakout session, a discussion um, based around a set of three questions. Um, and there will also be facilitators to help that discussion and also pick up some of the uh, insights that you generate. So online, there will be uh, breakout rooms in Zoom. And here in the room, uh, we encourage you to quickly turn your chairs around, find somebody to have a discussion with, and ideally, as ever, to find somebody that you don't normally work with. Uh, so really look at trying to have a, a diverse group. So you have about 25 minutes. Um, to look at the set of questions here that are on the board. Really, how can state and national governments enable regional action on climate resilience? How can that be fair and inclusive? And how can the regions share learning, collaborate and innovate effectively? Hello, sorry. And uh, just before we start, uh, we have a couple of regional representatives here who would like to just say a few words as well based upon what they've seen and uh, from a few different uh, parts of uh, Europe and around the world as well. And uh, first of all, I'd like to turn, if, if it's okay, just to have a few words, invite a few words from uh, President uh, uh, Maria Vida from uh, the, sorry, from the region of Navarra for a few words. We have a, do we have a microphone? So um, can you hear from here? It's okay, okay. And I will present you and introduce you, Maria Chivita, the president of the government of Navarra, who will speak in Spanish and I will translate it. Uh, thank you. Bueno, lo primero, muchas gracias es por encontrar un espacio para poder compartir con diferentes regiones y sus entidades para compartir conocimiento y difundir y hacer esas transferencias y luchar en común contra el cambio climático. Bueno, el proyecto que estamos haciendo en Navarra es el proyecto Life Nadacta, es un trabajo que comenzó en el año 2017 y que va a durar ocho años, cuyo objetivo es conocer mejor nuestro territorio frente al cambio climático para que sea más resiliente. Se trata de un proyecto integrado, transversal, eh, de adaptación al cambio climático en distintas áreas de actividad de nuestra comunidad. Queremos con este proyecto conocer, medir y seguir la evolución del clima y su efecto en Navarra mediante un portal de indicadores totalmente público y desde el gobierno se desarrollan acciones de adaptación al cambio climático en distintas áreas. Thank you very much. The, first of all, I would like to highlight the relationship with different regions and uh, the entities that help us to share knowledge and disseminate networking, transfer and replication for the sake of common fight against this problem. And we are uh, really happy to, to be here as a government of Navarra. The project that we are developing is a Life and Adapta, which is a project has begun in 2017 and will last eight years. The objective of which is to better understand our territory in the face of climate change so that is more resilient against the threats of climate that has already changed and will continue. It is ambitious, integrated and transversal project for the development of adaptation measures to climate change in different areas of activity of our community. Thanks to NADAPTA.
were able to know, measure, and follow the evolution of the climate and its effects in Navarra through a portal of indicators, which is totally public. And the government develops adaptation actions to climate change in different areas that I will go on in detail. En el sector agua se están desarrollando nuevos protocolos de emergencia frente a las inundaciones con sistemas de alerta y herramientas de gestión digitales. En el sector de bosques, además de trabajar con respecto a los incendios, se han identificado las áreas más vulnerables al cambio climático y se conservan semillas de las especies más resilientes. En agricultura y ganadería se están recuperando variedades antiguas más adaptadas a las nuevas condiciones climáticas. En cuanto a la salud humana, se están mejorando los sistemas de seguimiento alerta y los protocolos de actuación gracias a las nuevas tecnologías, pero también gracias a la formación del público en general y también del sector laboral. En el ámbito urbano se han puesto en marcha sistemas urbanos de drenaje sostenibles de las aguas pluviales y se adapta el patrimonio construido a las nuevas condiciones energéticas y de confort en los edificios y viviendas públicas, pero también en las calles y plazas. Y en el paisaje estamos conociendo cuáles son los paisajes más singulares y los más sensibles y estamos trabajando en su gestión y conservación ante el cambio climático. In the water sector, new emergency protocols for foliage and being developed with alert systems and digital management tools. In the forest sector, in addition to working with respect to fires, the areas most vulnerable to climate change have been identified and seeds of the most resilient species conserved. In agriculture and livestock, all varieties more adapted to the new climate conditions are being recovered. Warning systems for pests and emerging diseases are being implemented and initiatives to prevent forest skis are being developed thanks to the collaboration between extensive livestock and forest management. And regarding human health, monitoring systems, alert systems, and action protocols are being improved thanks to new technologies, but also thanks to the training of both the general public and the labor sector. In urban areas, sustainable urban drainage systems for rainwater have been implemented, and the wild heritage is adapted to the new energy and comfort conditions in buildings and public housing, but also in streets and squares. And the landscapes we are learning, which are the most unique and the most sensitive, and we are working on the management and conservation in the face to climate change. In the case of the transition energetica, the project has permitted the study and the impulse of local energy communities que supone un paso más en el autoconsumo y nos va a permitir compartir la energía entre diferentes entidades, entre el sector público, sector privado y los habitantes. En relación a este tema, quiero también anunciar que ahora en el 16-17 de noviembre se va a celebrar en Navarra el primer Congreso Europeo de Comunidades Energéticas que reunirá a expertos de toda Europa. Además, gracias a Nadapta se ha podido desarrollar la plataforma que muestra el consumo energético de los edificios públicos porque consideramos que la administración pública debe tener un papel ejemplarizante en el proceso de cumplir con los objetivos de descarbonización acordados en el Pacto de París. In the case of energy transition, the NADAPTER project has allowed the study and promotion of local energy communities. This figure represents one more step in self-consumption. It will allow us to share energy between different entities, between the public sector, the private sector and the inhabitants. In relation to this topic, I would like to announce that the first European Congress of Energy Communities will be held in Navarra on November 16 and 17, which will bring together experts from all over Europe to discuss and learn about successful models. In addition, thanks to NADAPTA, it has been possible to develop the safe platform which shows the energy consumption of public buildings. We believe that the public administration should play an exemplary role in the process of meeting the decarbonization objectives agreed in the Paris Pact. Además, gracias al NADAPTA se ha podido desarrollar eh, una ayuda y un acompañamiento directo a cada municipio para desarrollar los planes de acción de clima y energía sostenible con medidas específicas de mitigación y adaptación. Fomentamos así una relación más directa con la ciudadanía y con sus necesidades. Y también ha servido para mejorar la coordinación entre los departamentos y otras entidades del gobierno con la colaboración entre servicios para la inclusión de políticas de cambio climático en toda la planificación sectorial y el desarrollo de sinergias frente a retos complementarios como las estrategias europeas del Green Deal, los fondos Next Generation o el Climate Pact y por supuesto los objetivos ODS 2030. La colaboración y coordinación ha permitido desarrollar la nueva ley foral de cambio climático y transición energética que es nuestra herramienta normativa más potente y avanzada para la consecución de los objetivos de lucha contra el cambio climático y la obtención de un nuevo modelo energético más sostenible y resiliente. 
NALAPTA provides direct assistance and support to each municipality to develop climate action plan and sustainability energy with a specific mitigation and adaptation measures. In this way, we foster some more direct relationship with citizens, their concerns and needs. The NALAPTA project has also served to improve coordination between government, departments and other entities, which collaboration between services for the inclusion of climate change policies in sectoral planning, and the develop of synergies in the face of complementary challenges such as strategies, European Green Deal, the Next Generation Funds or Climate Pact, and of course, the uh, Sustainable Development uh, Gets of Objectives 2030. Collaboration and coordination has made it possible to develop the new regional law on climate change and energy transition, our most powerful and advanced regulatory tool for achieving the objectives of the fight against climate change and obtaining a new, more sustainable and resilient energy model. Thank you very much, and we are happy to collaborate with other regions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. We're going to have one other uh, short, intra, short set of comments from uh, regional leadership before we move into the breakout groups. I'd like to invite Mr. Tiago Pampolha, Secretary of Environment and Sustainability for the state of Rio de Janeiro to make uh, a couple of short comments. Actually, I'm just being told Mr. Tiago Pauhampole is not with us actually, so we'll move to the breakout groups. So then just as a reminder, we're gonna to move to the set of breakout groups. The questions uh, are here on the screen uh, and available online on the Zoom groups. Um, so you have about 20 minutes now um, just to have a conversation. You can take off your headphones for those in the room. Um, please do try and keep your masks on and maintain some degree of social distance. But I'd really like you to work with your facilitators just to also summarize some headline points at the end of the session. So 20 minutes. Look forward to hearing back from you shortly.
Yeah. Okay, just ladies and gentlemen in the room, if we could finish the discussions in two minutes, please, and we'll come back in. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm afraid we're going to have to come back into the plenary session. Sorry to interrupt such lively conversations. And can I ask you, also ask you to put the headsets back on so we can hear from those online? Okay. So we are a little short on time now. So I'm going to ask for um, three quick reflections from the floor or online in terms of things that have come out of the conversation. So I saw a group over here in the room, um, back in the corner. Andy, you're gonna offer us some reflections, but is there a roving mic that we can, Neil, could you just help with? And also again, please use your headsets um, to be able to get the sound from online as well. Thanks, Anna. So, um, Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay in the headsets? So we had a, a really interesting group ranging from, uh, from America, from Honduras, uh, from Spain, uh, and from Scotland. And I suppose the three reflections that come back from that, one was the question about what does success look like? There isn't an end point, it's a process of resilience. There isn't a sort of a final point. So then the question of how do you get the metrics, how do you get the standard, uh, sorry, the, the, the standardization to allow you to understand that you're going forward. One was an absolute one that we've picked up um, through this afternoon, which is the, 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 the need for collaboration, but also for clarity on roles and responsibilities of the different uh, groups and so on. And we had a very powerful comment from Honduras pointing out that this isn't just about doing resilience. In some cases, it's about survival. You know, they were talking about two category five hurricanes hitting this year. Um, and that there is a need then to completely rethink what we mean by adaptation if you are facing those sorts of, of odds. And that brought us on the issue to the issue of resources. And in particular, not just the financial resources, but also how do we build both a national level plan, but also then a sub-national, sort of regional municipal plan, because they will be very different in different parts of the world. 
And it's as much about the capability building at that level as much as about simply the financing. So I think that's my, my reflection. Thank you, Andy. Very good. Well done, group. And then there's the next group over here. Yes, sir, please you. Thank you. We were here in the Swedish Flemish connection. Um, we had, first of all, an uh, academic reflection on the questions, certainly on question two, um, discrimination or not. And we didn't finish our discussion because we felt also that there is a different type of politics when you are working on your local and regional level, comparing sometimes with the European level. But the conclusion that it's the first time where the subnational levels are so important on a climate conference like this, that's for true. And that's very important. That's very important because we are sure, and then I think that uh, my colleague here can uh, uh, confirm, we are sure 70 to 75% of the problem is located locally, but 70 to 75% of the solution is also locally, but we don't have always all the tools in our hands. So we really need to fight for this more bottom-up approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so we have 28 participants. So we have 28 participants in the online forum, but I'm afraid we've only got time for one comment from one of the breakout groups. So maybe if Kay is there from the Scottish Government, I could turn to Kay and ask her to give some summary comments. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Tom. And uh, thanks to everyone in the room and to everyone in my breakout group. Uh, it was amazing that we had so many people from across the world and just an advantage of having this event in a virtual setting. Um, so we had participants from um, New York, Germany, California. Um, so yeah, just really diverse voices, which was amazing. So three quick points of reflection from the, from the conversation. One was that in still in some regions, in some, um, in some areas, the focus is very much uh, on reactive resilience and react, reacting to, um, to crises rather than uh, moving towards preventative mechanisms. Um, and there's a lot that we can learn, especially from uh, communities in the global south who are already experiencing um, these effects, um, which are now kind of encroaching uh, upon, upon us in more kind of global north or, or western communities. Um, another thing uh, when we're talking about fairness and inclusivity is that the communities need to be right there from the off. Um, they have the solutions, they have the local knowledge. So when we're implementing local planning, um, you know, regional funding, etc. You know, we need to have these people with us on board um, right from the beginning um, and, and make sure that we have public participation and engagement and also inclusive decision making. Um, thirdly, um, we definitely identified kind of three key areas of um, resource gaps. Um, there seems to be a bit of a gap in some areas from the national level down to the regional uh, level, uh, whether that's in terms of funding, um, staffing, or also information gaps. So it just seems to be a really big resource question. Um, but yeah, we had a really wonderful, um, really you know, invigorating discussion. So thanks to all of you who are in my group, and I'm sure the rest of our online participants. Um, the feedback has has also been great so far. So thank you. Back to you, Tom. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and the ability to try and blend reflections online with reflections in the room, I think is great to be able to do at a conference like this and particularly to hear, some, hear from such diverse regions. I'm going to turn just in closing to our panelists to ask if there are any kind of one or two minute final reflections from you in terms of what you've heard and how it does or doesn't resonate with your own experience. So maybe new and Tara, I could start with you. 
Great, thank you so much. Um, this was a wonderful conversation and I really, um, what I think struck me is just the commonality of the challenges that we're all facing, but also the opportunity to learn just in real time as we're working to find these solutions. And I, um, one of the reflections from the online um, group that we heard from around needing to move from a reactive to proactive space, I think is a really important point and something we're, we're working on quite hard to, to do in, in California. So um, really excited for the opportunity to be here and to learn from everybody and to make that shift together. Thank you. Uh, seeing you again, it was great. I think the three teams brought us a lot of reflection and we were talking between us. I just got one point to say for 30 seconds. I think uh, the, the theme of need, the cooperation we need between us, I think that the, the sub-level gains a lot. And as the Flemish and Swedish group said, the sub-level is very important. 70 or 75 percent of the problem is locally. And today I'm very happy that the, our governor from Brazil, from the state of Pernambuco, he's here. And we're talking just now about this need of talking between the governors. You can imagine if all governors like California and Sao Paulo are doing a team now, we will learn from each another. It's to, uh, to do what we can do better. It's in the sub you know, local, but in the local uh, with the municipalities. I think this is the clue for the good uh, regions uh, to go. Thank you very much for having the time to divide with you. Thank you, Governor, to be with us. Thank you. Um, there's not much I can really add um, other than to say that um, it's been really interesting for me personally to hear all the reflections. I think the key word is collaboration, uh, and it was really um, important to surface the, the role of um, subnational uh, local areas, regions in finding solutions for building climate resilience. So thank you for attending, either in person or um, online, and I hope you found the event really useful too. Uh, and uh, there is a reception afterwards, which will be put up um, in short time, hopefully. So uh, everyone, of course, is welcome to attend that on behalf of all the organizers. Thank you. Thank you. Sincere thanks to everybody. I think this is one of the first conversations I've been in where we've had regional representation of some of the most ambitious regions from almost every continent. And the being able to share at a much more detailed level than we normally get the chance to do about some of the opportunities that adaptation resilience poses, as well as some of the existential threats. And I think just in closing, I would say that from Climate Kick's perspective, um, we are really, as an innovation agency, trying to think what does it mean to put adaptation and resilience at the heart of our industrial development strategies, our economic strategies, not just from a sense of defending what we've got, but the idea of thriving in a future climate. The idea that adaptation and resilience in itself can be an opportunity for innovation, for job creation, for improved well-being, for inclusive development, and of course, as a way to trial the new innovations that we're gonna to need to be able to withstand the problems of the future. So for us, it's an innovation opportunity, one for jobs and growth. If you are a region that really is thinking about the most ambitious strategies, wanting to be a beacon of leadership in the adaptation economy of the future, we would love to hear from you. That's part of our race to resilience commitment and part of the work we're doing in partnership with uh, regions adapt and we very much look forward to hearing from you. So just in closing, I would love to thank the government of Scotland, uh, the state government of California, um, the speakers that we've seen today, Adaptation Scotland and partners at uh, Regions Adapt and Regions 4. And just to reiterate David's invitation, we are going to reorganize this space in very short order um, and begin a reception, a networking reception uh, in about 10 or 15 minutes time. We would like to invite you to stay and to continue the conversations. Uh, and again, sincere thanks to all the participants online as well, who unfortunately won't be able to join us for the networking reception in the room. Um, and in closing, thank you very much and have a good evening.